Good afternoon and thank you for coming. So my name is Denis Volkov and I uh, work uh, here at PHRD and CMOS, University of Miami. And uh, so I think it's been almost two years since we had a discussion group here at AML together with scientists from across the street. And we were talking about this global warming slowdown. And this group was led by Marlos Goes. And actually this uh, discussion group motivated us to do some research on the uh, regional distribution of heat in the ocean. And then it led to a proposal that we submitted to NASA and that was just recently selected for funding. And we already have some first results on this work. So we initiated this work by looking at the particular region. And today, so I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the decade-long deep ocean warming uh, in the subtropical South Pacific. So before I start, I want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors. Uh, actually, we just had a paper published in Geophysical Research Letters on this subject. And so I want to acknowledge Sun Ki Lee, Felix Landerer from GPL, Rick Lumpkin, who are the co-authors on the paper. And also Gustavo Goni, Chris Mine, and Luis Rivero, who will be contributing to the uh, big project. That this is a four-year project that is just starting. So uh, I'm starting with this uh, uh, picture, which is uh, many of you uh, might be familiar with. So this is the scheme of global energy flow from uh, Trenberg et al. 2009 paper. So these broader arrows, they show the flows of energy and their size is proportional to their importance. So overall, the Earth absorbs about 240 watts per, square, per meter squared, which is uh, balanced by approximately the same amount of outgoing long wave radiation. But the satellite observations have shown that <clears throat> the Earth climate system has been experiencing the positive energy imbalance, uh, which means that the Earth was absorbing more solar energy than it was radiating back to space. For the early 2000s, uh, Trendberth et al., uh, they gave an estimate of 0 0.9 with an uncertainty of 0 0.5 uh, watts per meter squared. And then for later period from 2005 to 2010, Hansen et al., uh, they provided an estimate of 0 0.6 with an uncertainty of 0 0.2. So the energy imbalance arises uh, due to the changes in climate forcings that act on the uh, planet and com in combination with the planet's thermal inertia. So for example, uh, when the sun becomes brighter, that provides a positive uh, forcing and causes uh, warming. On the other hand, the ocean's thermal inertia, because of the ocean's Thermal inertia may require uh, centuries for the Earth's uh, surface temperature to fully respond to changes in climate forcing. Um, emissions of greenhouse gases and um, uh, human-made aerosols, they uh, represent an anthropogenic climate forcing. So in this figure, uh, this figure is also from Hansen, um, it shows the time series of the uh, solar irradiance at the top of the atmosphere. And you see that the solar irradiance is not constant, but it, it has some cyclicity. And uh, so if the sun were the only climate forcing, then during the solar maxima, indicated by these peaks, the Earth would gain heat, but it, it would lose heat during solar minima. And what is interesting to note here is that from 2005 to 2010, uh, we were at the deepest solar minima. And the range of the solar uh, forcing variability is about 0 0.25 watts per uh, meter squared. So it is interesting uh, to compare with the uh, estimate of Hansen for the same time interval, because that means that um, the uh, energy imbalance we, we are observing is not related to solar forcing, but it is very likely that anthropogenic climate forcing is dominant here. So we know that most of this excess heat is going into the ocean. Well, first because the ocean covers 71% of the surface of the planet, and also because of the enormous uh, uh, heat capacity of the ocean. So namely, the ocean absorbs about 90% of all the excess energy. 
as shown by this diagram. So, um, despite uh, the positive energy imbalance, it has been reported, including the 2013 IPCC report, that the, there was a um, slowdown in global warming that started uh, around 1998 and lasted at least until 2012. So, because of this, since we had still had this um, um, net energy imbalance, and but the surface temperatures were not rising, as you can see here, for example, so this period was termed as a hiatus period or the global warming pause. So, this uh, fact has motivated plenty of uh, studies that tried to investigate actually the fate of this excess heat and trying to explain this slowdown by the redistribution of heat within the ocean. However, um, there was no clear consensus of where exactly this missing heat could be accumulating. Later on, uh, there were several studies, just recent studies, that uh, actually debunked this uh, global warming slowdown theory. And they showed that this apparent hiatus could be an artifact of data biases because of different measurements of temperature by modern buoys and all the measurements by uh, ships from ships. And then, in 2015, so the surface temperature jumped up, as you can see here, and actually 2016 was <laughs> the warmest year on record. And this actually confirmed that the global uh, warming the warming of the oceans is steady, and even if the hiatus uh, was real, uh, this means that it had ended already, at least. So, but no matter, uh, regardless of whether the hiatus uh, was real or not, the question of surplus heat sequestration and the role of the ocean in particular remains open. So, here you see uh, the global mean sea level rise. This is from a visa website. So, actually, this, uh, if the ocean continues to accumulate heat, so part of this heat goes on uh, rising sea levels. And uh, here you see that the global mean sea level has been rising at a rate of uh, three, about 3.3 millimeters per year. And this picture also shows that there is no hiatus in the sea level record. So, the sea level has been rising pretty steadily. Well, the sea level changes because when we add mass to the, uh, to the ocean, this is mainly due to melting glaciers and ice sheets and also because of the ocean warming so, uh, and associated thermal expansion of seawater. Um, the total sea level has been measured by satellite altimetry, while the mass-related sea level has been measured since 2002 by uh, GRACE satellites. Argo floats provide estimates of the upper 2,000 meters static uh, sea level change. And so, the only part which is missing is the deep static, so everything which is below 2,000 meters. Well, it can be inferred from uh, hydrographic measurements, so we have the global hydrographic repeat uh, hydrography sections. And so, from these sections, it is possible to infer the long-term change of the deep ocean temperature change. And it also can be inferred theoretically, and uh, this is what I'm going to show you next, it can be inferred indirectly when we subtract uh, GRACE and ARGO data from altimetry, and thus uh, uh, the, the, the residual part will be associated with uh, static changes in the deep ocean. So, this is a, recent, a picture from a recent paper by uh, Lovell et al. that was published uh, in Nature Climate Change and it was dedicated to the role of the deep ocean globally for the uh, global mean sea level change. And here you see the time series of the global mean sea level as observed by altimetry, the mass-related component uh, observed by gray satellites, and the red curve, curve here shows the upper 2,000 meter static sea level change. So, it appears that actually the mass uh, change contributes about two-thirds of the total sea level change, while the static component is responsible for uh, one-third of the, of the change. Um, 
when they subtracted grace data from altimetry, they got a residual, which is the black dashed black curve over here, and they concluded that this residual aligns very well with Argo measurements, and therefore um, they conclude that there, there was no, during the time period they considered, this is from 2005 to 2013, that there was no significant deep ocean warming uh, globally. This result was also later confirmed by Dean Catal, so this is a 2015 paper. Well, the results based on the combination of satellite and Argo data is somewhat contradictory to uh, the results obtained from repeat hydrography sections. And uh, so it's been reported that uh, based on these uh, sections, temperature measurements along these sections shown here, that significant deep ocean warming occurred from 90s to uh, 1990s to 2000s, and uh, that the deep and abyssal warming contributes to a thermostatic sea level rise of about 1.17 millimeters per decade, which uh, constitutes approximately 4% of the total sea level rise. It's been also shown that there is no significant difference between the trends computed before 2000 and after 2000. And this indicates that there was no increased heat uptake during, uh, by the deep ocean during the hiatus period. Um, as you can see in this figure that shows you the uh, mean local heat fluxes through 4,000 meters depth, uh, implied by abyssal warming that most of warming was concentrated in the southern hemisphere and the more recent paper by Desbruyer et al. Uh, shows that about two-thirds of the global long-term heat content change below 2,000 meters is attributed to the southern ocean. Well, this is only for the abyssal warming. Uh, that was the paper by Perkin Johnson, 2010. Below 4,000. 4, so this only uh, is related to uh, everything below 4,000. But the recent paper uh, deals actually with everything which is below 2,000. So the overall uh, goal of uh, this study and of the project, uh, the entire project is to obtain a more complete view and understanding of the horizontal and vertical distributions of heat in the ocean by combining the present day satellite and in situ observing systems. Well, it is uh, reasonable to look for the signs of uh, deep ocean warming in uh, the places of heat accumulation as revealed by uh, the full depth steric sea level change. And this full depth steric sea level change can be obtained by subtracting grace data from altimetry. This is what this figure actually shows. And you see that two regions actually stand out. This is the south, subtropical South Indian and subtropical South Pacific Oceans. Um, so these regions are outlined by boxes A and B here. And each of these boxes contributes nearly 25% of the global steric sea level rise. And uh, if we assume that the holosteric contribution to the steric sea level rise is negligible, uh, which is uh, uh, valid for the entire globe, um, then these regions can be uh, considered as basically Earth's major heat accumulators over the study period. So this is this we, we are considering period from 2005 to 2014. We also looked at the heat content changes uh, from Argo floats in uh, these regions. And uh, so here you see for the upper 1,000 meters, the top plots, and for the layer below between 1,000 and 2,000 meters. So this is for the Indian Ocean, this is for the South Pacific Ocean. And what, what you can see that in the Indian Ocean, warming is limited to the upper 1,000 meters. And actually, a recent paper by Lavelle and Lee, they showed that uh, steric sea level rise in this region was largely attributed to uh, uh, changes in salinity, although no mechanisms were actually proposed. But as you can see, in the subtropical South Pacific, 
uh, the warming extended at least to 2,000 meters depth as evidenced by uh, these significant trends over here. So the questions I'm going to address in the remainder of this uh, presentation is uh, the questions are did the observed accumulation of uh, heat in the subtropical South Pacific uh, in 2005-2014 extend below 2,000 meters and second what physical processes were responsible for the observed heat accumulation in the region. All right, so what data did we use and, uh, and how? So we used daily, uh, uh, daily gridded satellite altimetry product from Aviso. This data were monthly uh, average to match uh, monthly GRACE and Argo products. Uh, for the uh, GRACE, we used actually four solutions, uh, four GRACE products. The three products uh, are from the standard harmonic, uh, um, standard spherical harmonic solutions, they're from CSR, GFZ and JPL. And then there is a UVA product, uh, so-called mass cons or mass concentration blocks. So, uh, in addition to uh, standard corrections applied to GRACE, we also applied a pole tight correction. So, this is a, this correction, this actually, this, is, this effect arises uh, due to uh, polar motion and it uh, generates a signal that is actually not uh, part of the ocean mass change and therefore it has to be corrected for. And the corrections applied for uh, mask on CSI and GPL expressed as the sea level trend shown here and this is the correction for GFZ product. So uh, for the Argo we used actually two products. Uh, this is from Scripps and Jumpstack, this agreed uh, data. And also we used uh, two sections from repeat hydrography. This is P16 section, the meridional section that was occupied in January, February 2005 and uh, then in March, May 2014 and this section is uh, actually central to our investigations but it's important because uh, it, uh, the times of occupation actually coincide with the start and the end of our uh, time interval that we are considering here. <coughs> but also for comparison we used uh, the zonal P06 section that was occupied in August, September 2003 and the last occupation was in November, December 2009. There is another section over here, P16, but uh, it was occupied in 2001, 2009, so we didn't actually consider it. Okay, so the next important step in this investigation is to uh, assess uncertainties of each observing system. So for altimetry, to, uh, to assess the uncertainty of altimetry data in this region when we averaged over the region. We use tight gauges, so unfortunately there are no tight gauges within box B, but there are some tight gauges, uh, island tight gauges just, just north of it. So um, tight gauges, uh, tight gauge records were corrected for inverted barometer and uh, glacial as a static adjustment corrections. And uh, altimetry data were linearly interpolated on this and in brackets you see the root mean square differences between uh, altimetry and tight gauges and you see that these differences are between 2 and 3 centimeters. So we assume that the conservative uncertainty for altimetry data um, in this uh, region would be 30 millimeters. <coughs> The uh, conservative uncertainty for GRACE data in the region is about 12 millimeters and this is supported by comparison with uh, bottom pressure recorders that are located here but unfortunately these recorders are not functioning anymore. So. Um, Jumpstack data, they provide uncertainties for temperature and salinity at each grid point and each uh, uh, depth level. So these uncertainties were used to obtain um, the overall uncertainty of 17 millimeters for the static sea level. And for repeat hydrography, uh, so we used the uh, ECHO2 ocean state estimate to compute the 95 percent confidence intervals um, computed as uh, plus minus two sigma of temperature variability in, in the model. 
All right, so uh, assuming that these observing systems are independent, errors are random, so this means that the sum and quadrature uh, is the random error of the residual, and uh, this is applicable for the difference between altimetry and grace, and difference between altimetry, grace, and Argo data. And also, when we average over the entire box B, then the uncertainty of altimetry data, considering the spatial decorrelation scales, the uncertainty of altimetry and Argo data are reduced to 4 and, uh, um, 4 and 10 millimeters, respectively. And this zero is, is 95% uh, of density? Yeah. Is it? The what? No, the error. What you call the error? Is a standard deviation? The RMS is 95% confident? Two, two sigma, yeah. Oh, two sigma. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so the next step was to, uh, we actually subtracted the monthly climatology <laughs> from uh, the monthly time series. And then from altimetry and grace, we computed the full depth steric sea level. And from Argo, we computed uh, upper 2,000 meters steric sea level. And then estimated the deep ocean contribution as the residual from alt uh, satellite and Argo data. And we also uh, computed the direct estimate from um, repeat hydrography, basically from the temperature change from one, one occupation to the next. Uh, in addition, we used, uh, so to understand the mechanisms what caused the observed accumulation of heat, we also used wind stress and surface heat fluxes from uh, ERA interim and SEP2 and MERA reanalysis. So, for the following estimates, uh, so the linear trends are least squares feet to monthly time series over the time interval of study, and then the trend uncertainty was computed as the 95% confidence interval for the slope in the data and plus the 95% percentile slope estimated from 10,000 uh, random time series with a standard deviation um, equal to the random measurement error. Okay, so uh, now these are the results. <clears throat> so we have our box situated uh, in between the uh, trade wind zone in the tropics and ACC driven by westerly winds over here, we have the uh, increase of temperature in the upper 2000 meters as evidenced by Argo observations. And here you see the time series of different sea level components. So this is the time series of altimetry. Uh, these are all four GRACE products. Um, the shading areas, shaded areas, they show the uncertainties. Here, these uh, curves uh, show uh, the difference between altimetry and grace, and light blue and blue curves, they show um, steric sea level from Argo products, and these dotted blue curves, they show the uncertainty levels. And um, the trends are summarized in this table. So we see that in box B, uh, sea level was rising by 8.3 millimeters per year. Uh, the mass-related change of sea level varied from an insignificant number given by mass solution to uh, 1.9 millimeters per year, which is just slightly below the global mean ocean mass change of 2 millimeters per year. And the difference varies from 6.4 to 7.4. So the difference is the uh, full depth steric sea level change uh, varies between 6.4 uh, to 7.4 millimeters per year. Uh, the Argo products, they agree with each other very well. So actually, the uh, and they both show uh, the steric, the upper ocean steric sea level change of about 4.5 uh, millimeters per year. All right, so uh, let's uh, look now at the uh, vertical temperature sections in box B. So this part shows the temperature change in the upper 2,000 meters. This is basically the temperature trend uh, from Argo data. And uh, the contours here, I hope you can see the, there are actually double contours. So there is a dotted contour that shows uh, uh, that shows the first month of the trend, isotherms in the first month of the trend, and the solid shows the isotherms in the last month of the trend. 
And the same is for the uh, deeper ocean below 2000 meters. This is obtained from uh, P16 section. So this is a temperature change between occupation in 2005 and 2014. And uh, this graph over here shows the uh, mean temperature change between uh, between actually 25 and uh, 50 degrees south with 95% confidence intervals shown by um, red curves. So uh, we see that warming in box B um, is associated, as you can see here, is associated with downward shift of isotherms over this decade. Uh, isotherms also shifted uh, northward over the ACC, ca causing a cooling trend over here. Uh, we see that significant temperature rise uh, was observed in almost the entire water column between 2000 and 5500 meters depth, as shown here. And the uh, average temperature uh, rise between 2000, between in this depth interval is equal to 0 0.012 uh, degrees centigrade per decade. And this is equivalent to a sea level rise of 0 0.7 plus minus 0 0.4 millimeters per year. So now it is also interesting to look how uh, salinity change. So it is interesting because uh, salinity changes can uh, give us some ideas on um, the redistribution of water masses in the region. And this is salinity trend also similar to temperature trend I showed you from Argo data. So, again, there are double uh, contours. So, the white contours show uh, the first month of the trend and the last, uh, the black contour is the last month of the trend. And it, as you can see here, that the, 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 the isoha lines, they shifted southward during this decade, meaning that there was more warm and salty tropical water advected into the region. Uh, the Isaac Alliance also moved northward over the ACC, uh, meaning that there is more Antarctic surface water coming in. And actually, Antarctic surface water, when it reaches the polar front at about 50 and 60 degrees south, so it encounters the polar uh, convergence, uh, the Antarctic convergence zone, and subsides under the subantarctic warmer and saltier subantarctic water, and forms the Antarctic intermediate water, which is uh, uh, seen as a um, water mass uh, with a sali local salinity minimum over here. So it's basically squeezed between the warmer and saltier uh, subantarctic water and uh, uh, colder and saltier deeper water. And what you can see here that <coughs> What you can see here that salinity of Antarctic intermediate water decreased by up to 0.02 PSU. And this is suggestive of a strengthening of convergence at the polar front and increased production of the Antarctic intermediate water. So now it is also interesting to see how, for, just for comparison, how temperature changed at uh, per, uh, the perpendicular section. So this is a P. O6 section, which is perpendicular to P16, and this section was occupied in uh, 2003 and in 2019. Sorry, 2009. That's a mistake. <laughs> 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 so, so we see that, and again, this is the temperature um, averaged over um, um, this extent from um, 185 to 250 uh, degrees east with uh, confidence intervals. So you see that there, there is no significant uh, significant deep ocean temperature change uh, over the uh, water column. So only there is significant change only below about 4,700, which is occupied by the Antarctic uh, bottom water. And uh, this is consistent with earlier studies by Perkin Johnson. So, uh, so we see that there is no significant temperature change overall 
in this time interval, but there was significant temperature change from 2005 to uh, 2014. And this means that uh, interannual variability in this region at depth is significant. Okay, so now let's look at indirect estimates of deep ocean warming. So again, I'm showing you uh, these figures of different components of sea level change. And uh, so when we subtract uh, grays from altimetry and uh, argo from altimetry, we get this residual with uh, some uncertainty. So these multiple curves, they show these residuals for uh, all data products that we consider it. And uh, the steric sea level change associated with deep ocean temperature change is shown over here in this table. And uh, so we see that our values, they range from the minimum is 1.8 millimeters per year, this is significant, with an uncertainty of 1.4, uh, and the maximum is given when we use uh, mass cons and jump stack data, and this estimate is 3 uh, millimeters per year with an uncertainty of 1.3. Uh, here I'm also showing you the uh, steric sea level change uh, obtained from uh, hydrography data, which is 0 0.7 plus minus 0 0.4, uh, and it is lower than, uh, than the estimates derived from satellites and um, Argo floats. So, uh, Relatively wide range of estimates for the deep ocean contribution is mainly due to uncertainties in the local uh, gray strands, and this is even after the correct gray strands for uh, polar tide. Uh, actually, that correction uh, um, brought different uh, products closer together, but still the largest uncertainty is associated with grays. Nevertheless, uh, We see that uh, although the direct estimates are greater than the direct estimates, so, but uh, both methods, they agree within the error bus. So especially when we look at the uh, lower estimate compared to this, so they agree at least within the error bus. And this is kind of, this is basically a first uh, confirmation that uh, uh, the residual method and uh, the direct method, the agree with each other with the, in this region. And uh, the sea level change associated with uh, uh, from the direct estimate is shown here by this uh, line. And these dots, they indicate the times of occupations of P16 section. Okay, so now let's uh, uh, see what dynamical processes could uh, lead to the observed heat accumulation. So the change in heat content uh, occurs because of the changes in uh, net surface heat flux and also due to advection. So we used uh, different reanalysis to estimate the uh, net surface heat flux into the ocean. So positive means uh, downward uh, here. So uh, we have estimates for the climatology, which is from 1979 to 2015, and for the uh, time period from 2005 to 2014. And as you see that in 2005-2014, all reanalysis, all the, all the data uh, show rather wide range of values, but still they all agree that in this time uh, interval, the net surface heat flux into the ocean decreased. So if advection uh, were constant, then the reduction of the net surface heat flux, uh, flux into the ocean would result in sea level decrease in box B. But we observe different things, opposite, we have a sea level rise. And this means that ASC heat exchange was not the driver of the observed heat content and sea level changes, and that the advection was so strong that it also compensated for the um, reduction in the net surface heat flux. So um, it's interesting that in uh, the time period of our study from 2005 to 2014, the South Pacific featured very strong relative to climatology, westerly 
and uh, trade winds. So we see this anomalies and these anomalies are actually uh, uh, strongest globally. And these anomalies, they led to intensified northward over here and southward um, Ekman transport that led first to the horizontal shifts of isotherms and isohalines that I uh, showed you earlier in the upper ocean and second to intensified Ekman pumping in the uh, subtropical South Pacific, so basically in, in the box we are studying. And this figure shows the anomalies of wind stress and Ekman pumping uh, positive means downward relative to climatology. And you see that in the uh, in box B there is a local maximum of uh, Ekman pumping. So uh, the observed uh, downward shift of isotherms I showed you earlier suggests that Ekman pumping may have uh, affected the deeper layers as well. And here in this graph I'm showing you the time integral of Ekman pumping shown in blue curve uh, and heat content change in box B. And you see that there is a very nice correlation between this uh, time series and also the uh, shaded area show the uh, Nino 3.4 index and uh, it shows that during the time when the heat content was uh, increasing in the uh, subtropical South Pacific, this time was characterized by persistent La Nina-like uh, conditions. So uh, it's also interesting to note that um, if you remember that section I showed you, the P06 section that was occupied in 2003 and 2009 when there was no significant deep ocean temperature change. It's interesting that Ekman pumping anomaly in 2003 and 2005 was mi minus 1.3 meters per year and then it increased to 1.4 in 2006-2009. So basically uh, between those occupations there was a, a reversal of Ekman pumping anomaly so that and as you can see here also that heat content was decreasing and then it started to rise. So uh, this interannual variability uh, may have is actually the um, the reason why we do not see we do not see significant temperature change at depth uh, along PO6 section. Also, uh, note that the study region started to lose heat uh, starting from 2014 and this was apparently triggered by weakening of westerly and trade winds uh, associated with the 2014-2016 El Nino event. So, uh, I have some summary and conclusions and after this I will just uh, show you two more slides about the uh, uh, project that we are uh, starting to work on and what will be uh, done for this project. So, uh, summary that our indirect estimates of deep ocean warming within the Aerobus agree with the direct estimate based on temperature measurements along the P16 hydrography line uh, well, we estimated the contribution of uh, box B to the global mean sea level, static sea level and heat content increase and we have this estimate, so it's 2.4, about 2.4 percent for the direct estimate and to 6.1 to 10.1 for the in the percent for the indirect estimates. I also show you that the observed uh, uh, warming at least partially reflects interannual to interdecadal variability and uh, that the directly and indirectly inferred deep ocean warming in 2005-2014 was consistent with the upper ocean warming and likely driven or at least favored by persistent wind driven convergence intrinsic to uh, La Nina conditions. Uh, Still, GRACE data has the largest uncertainty and um, should be used with appropriate care. 
And this study overall highlights the importance of first uh, monitoring the time evolution of the deep ocean uh, heat content, in particular in response to the last uh, El Nino event. And second, um, the importance of the implementation of deep um, Argo array in the region. And the pilot array was deployed in this region in January, February 2016. Okay, so uh, this is the project title that we have, it's Dynamics of uh, Regional Heat Convergence and Deep Ocean Warming in the Subtropical South Pacific and Indian Oceans. We also want to expand um, our study on the Indian Ocean. And these are the science questions that were proposed and to some of them actually we have already uh, answered it. So, does the observed accumulation of heat in the South Pacific warm pool extend below 2,000 meters and uh, can it account for the near surface heat loss during the hiatus period? So, if the hiatus was real or not, so that's still a question. Uh, then what physical processes and mechanisms are responsible for the observed accumulation of heat in the subtropical South Pacific, but also in the Indian Ocean? Um, why Indian Ocean is different from the South Pacific Ocean? Why there is no heat accumulation below 1,000 meters? And uh, interesting is how is the 2015-2016 um, El Nino event affecting the subtropical South Pacific and South Indian Ocean? So does it signify the onset of long-term uh, cooling trend or it is just a short-term transient negative anomaly. And for these studies we are going to use this combined analysis of satellite in situ and ocean model data and also perform some uh, numerical experiments uh, to because you want to quantify the impact of wind forcing on the observed trends to differentiate between the effects of uh, the westerly winds over the ACC and the trade winds in the tropics. Um, you want to isolate the local versus remote mechanisms for the observed heat accumulation and also investigate the roles of Antarctic intermediate water and Antarctic bottom water formation and transport in the regional heat accumulation. And what we are going to do for this project soon is to perform field experiments that, uh, aim, that aim to monitor the time evolution of the full depth heat content in the subtropical South Pacific Ocean. So for the uh, modeling component, we have already uh, performed a baseline experiment based on, well, MIT GCM in Echo 2 configuration. And here you see a comparison of sea level trends from uh, static sea level trends for 2005-2014 time period from satellites the same as I showed you earlier, and this is from the model, and you see that they both agree very well. So when we look at the heat content changes in observations and in the model, so here you see the uh, black curves showing uh, the uh, heat content uh, change, uh, heat content derived from Argo flows for the upper thousand meters and blue curves showed heat content derived from the model and you see that there is a very nice agreement between them. So the model is showing good results and hopefully can be used to understand the uh, mechanisms. So and the uh, what is coming soon actually in July uh, 2000, so in this, this year, so NOAA AML is providing two pressure inverted ECA sounders that will be deployed during the next occupation of PO6 section that is scheduled in uh, July, August 2017. <coughs> and uh, uh, so the PIs are planned to settle at depths of about, um, two, uh, about just above below 5,000 meters. Uh, the plant locations are indicated by the stars over here. So this region is characterized uh, as there is a branch of Antarctic bottom water that separates from the ACC and flows uh, uh, northward. So a uh, unique uh, aspect of this deployment is the use of uh, expandable data pods technology de developed by engineers at AML and uh, uh, each PICE will have four of these data pods that will be programmed to self-release after each year of measurements. and um, so the pies they measured around 
trip travel time for the acoustic signal. And uh, when combined with uh, uh, historic hydrography data from the region, this travel time can be calibrated into full depth uh, uh, profiles of temperature and salinity. And here you see the scatter plot showing uh, relationship between a uh, nice linear relationship between the dynamic height anomalies relative to uh, 1500 uh, decibar and the round trip acoustic travel time between the surface and 1500 meters decibel. So thank you very much for your attention and please ask questions. Models that match over the observations? Are they assimilating the Argo profiles? Uh, well, they, um, it's not like data assimilation as basically the model is adjusted to uh, Match. matched. Yeah, so it's a Green's functions approach. And is, is that, so let's say assume if it didn't have that, it would, it would not get the warming. Is the way it's projecting that or the way it's adjusting for that uh, kind of going to beg the question then? Could it like cast it into say, uh, surface heat fluxes or something in a way that, that, that maybe the real ocean isn't doing, or do you think it's, it's going to adjust? Well, the model is dynamically con consistent, so this is the main, you know, the, the main so point. Was, so it is dynamically, so it doesn't do real assimilation, so it's dynamically consistent and right. fluxes are conserved sorts. All right. Which means it puts it all back into the surface fluxes. Isn't that the whole point? essentially dynamically perfectly and says all of my errors were in air supplies. That's what I was worried about. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what it does. Yeah, yeah good point. Yeah. We're, we're preparing the other air supply customers to talk about how they say. Yeah. Fascinating, Dennis. Really, Thank really you. I have a lot of questions, but I got to pick one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can squeeze in two. So, first of all, Grace, um, somehow that, that's your biggest error source, right? And somehow you don't get any real huge benefit from spatial averaging like you do with Argo and altimetry for a box that size. Somehow the errors for Grace are large scale or something. Or, you don't get any well, you know, the Grace doesn't resolve signals less than thousand kilometers. Right. Right. So there is even when I was uh, when I was talking about the reduction of error when you average them spatially, grace doesn't the well, grace error doesn't there, reduce. Yeah. No, it's still still twelve millimeters. Yeah. And, so uh, on the ethan pumping, so that's kind of interesting. I, I guess I don't usually picture ethan pumping as extending affecting the isotherms that deep in the ocean. So is that I mean, is there, is there theoretical grounds for, for that to be reasonable, or can you actually infer from the displacement of the isotherms terms kind of like well, kind of that's more like a hypothesis, of course, still at this level. And um, so we, we can see the uh, displacement of isotherms in the upper 2,000 meters because we it is well observed, but not below, of course. So below is just the fact that um, temperature change uh, over this time interval between 2005 and 2014 uh, is significant and consistent with what we see at the surface. Um, lets us think that you know, persistent long-term wind forcing at the surface uh, may have led to this deepening of isotherms over the entire water column. If it's watering down deep, you must see vertical displacement of those deep isotherms too, right? So yeah, but we don't really, uh, you know, we have only we have only like uh, one-time observations at the sections, and these observations are biased by everything, like waves, tides, and so on. So it's really, I think it's really difficult to get a reliable uncertainty estimate for that, and. Uh, but you are right, so uh, there might be other mechanisms also, and some mechanisms were proposed by recent papers, and they were linked to uh, Antarctic bottom water and its formation regions. That in the, uh, because we see still 
significant change in the Antarctic bottom water. It is freshening, it is becoming uh, uh, warmer, and it has been linked to uh, to the formation regions around Antarctica. So this this is why I think it will be interesting to uh, uh, explore the PIES data when it becomes available and look at the transports of the Antarctic bottom water, look at how uh, deep ocean heat content changes. And well, I, have, in, I have yeah. lots of questions about how you're going to use the PIES data. Um, since there isn't very much hydrography in the area and you're basically calibrating your PIES data to measure the upper ocean using Argo data, dynamic height variability, how, how related is that to the signal that you're actually trying to get at? i.e. flow of Antarctic modeler. How correlated is the upper ocean thermocline to the deep signals? And do you know? Yeah. Well there are also, you know, there are pilot Argo array deployed uh, recently, which is still there. I think some flows failed, but I think six are working still. So and there will be another cruise also 2017, so we'll use all this data. The deep Argo goes to 6,000, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've seen the Argo data that's out there, and some of the deep sensors are off by 0 0.005, which is the signal that you're talking about. Okay. 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 <laughs> And the data well, we I think we will we will encounter these problems oh. the, surely. <laughs> yes, but then I think uh, yeah, we, we we did consider that, but um, it's it's not in the plan. Yeah, because it's problem to get the data back. Because we are not going to recover them. Yeah. It's too a remote uh, region and it's not <coughs> worth it to recover. So. It seems that the pies have a temperature that's a bit too low. The accuracy of the temperature sensor is too low to The temperature sensor itself inside the pies could be used, but it's also but it's the same problem. It doesn't get sent via telemetry, so it doesn't get sent via the data pods. And if you don't recover the instruments, you don't have it. Mm -hmm. So it's the same problem. Did you get Randy interested in actually wrapping up ancillary data? Not going to happen between now and July. <laughs> <laughs> We're shipping the instruments in three months. Not going to happen. <laughs> 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 More questions? Yeah. So you mentioned that there's more surface Antarctic water going northward <coughs> in, the, in the salinity is light, right? Well, Antarctic surface water, yeah, which is uh, actually pushed by Ekman transport at the surface. Oh, so that, right. Yeah. Now, because I was wondering if you have more of this water going northward or just a change in your TS property, so even if you don't change the amount, you just change the baseline of your mean Yes, well, this water subsides mm -hmm. at the at the Antarctic's uh, convergence zone. It subsides under the uh, warmer and saltier subantarctic water, and forms the Antarctic intermediate water. So there is definitely a kind of interplay between what is advected from the south and from the north. And at this point, we do not know what is more important, and that's why we want to do these experiments, numerical experiments, too understand, you know, what what region is more most influential for these changes. So I have an announcement that you probably don't know. Uh, Greg Johnson is going to be coming to visit us for the XP. He's one of our reviewers in the XPT um, science program. And so he'll be here two weeks from now and we'll be giving a <coughs> Mm -hmm. More questions? No? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.